Uh, if, if you haven't picked up, we are going to be going through a series uh, this term, uh, looking at this book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. It's probably got it backwards because of the way my camera's set up. Uh, so apologies if you couldn't actually read that, uh, but uh, I'll put a link to it in the email I'll send out later, along with uh, the video uh, that we'll post of this talk on YouTube. So I just want to uh, really speak to you as, about where you're at. Have you recently felt like you're operating at max capacity? Even like Duracell batteries aren't going to keep you going. Uh, pressure is building, that like anxieties are resurfacing. Uh, you feel like you might explode at any moment. Your legs are, you know, are jigging up and down a bit too often under the table. You, your little annoying habits are reappearing, maybe biting your nails, or if you're like me, I tap away when I'm feeling anxious. You're just feeling restless. You might even have a day when you're not busy, but you still struggle uh, to feel calm and relaxed and you feel on edge. Maybe you lash out easily. Maybe you're oversensitive to comments people make or you lose your temper too quickly. Not another Zoom meeting, you think. Forget stepping out for God and being the on-fire Christian that you wanted to be, uh, who committed themselves to building God's kingdom. Your prayer time has been replaced by Netflix. Your worship is replaced by Facebook. Your Bible reading is replaced by beer or wine or whatever your tipple might be. You're in survival mode and you're stuck in a cycle of frantic output and desperate need for escape at the end of the day. You're thinking it's only week two of a lockdown that's got no guaranteed ending. Boris might say at the end of the school half term in, in February, but we all know that Boris is an optimist and we have to take what he says with a pinch of salt. How am I going to cope? Or maybe uh, that's not you. Maybe you're more like this person. You're feeling bored. You're frustrated at the lack of freedom, the restrictions on what you can do, the lack of activity. Your motivation has sunk. It's got low. Just another hour in bed in the morning won't harm anyone. Why bother getting up anyway? Why bother getting dressed? In fact, maybe some of you here still have your pajamas on and uh, or maybe you've only got dressed from the top half. Just another hour in bed. Is it even worth brushing my teeth? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to admit if that's you. Uh, <laughs> Because what's the point in brushing your teeth if you're just going to spend the morning snacking and distracting yourself in a world of box sets? Season one, you start with. Then, oh, I'll watch season two, season three. You know, and there's unending seasons on some of these box sets. Before you know it, the daylight is fading and it's got to evening. But it's hard to get to sleep at night. Your mind is still restless. What it, asking big questions. What is my purpose? How long can they keep this furlough scheme going? Will I or he or she have a job in three months time? Restless. You check your phone and see what bad news there is on Twitter. Or you pop on the 10 o'clock news just to see what next bad headline there is. Now, I know that uh, that might be an extreme of different personalities and different circumstances. But many of us, if we're honest, uh, will find ourselves too busy or too distracted to follow Jesus during lockdown. I, I found it, I don't know about you, but I found the first lockdown was a, a great opportunity to refresh my faith with God. To come back to reading the Bible again, to get good habits in place back into my life. But it feels like this lockdown, I don't know, it feels like this is harder. I want to just look at uh, what maybe some of the problems, what, what are some of the causes of this sense of restlessness? We're going to be looking at a restlessness over the next term and what God has to say about it and how we can start to move from being a restless people to a people of rest. Or being restful. Kirsty, I wonder if we could have the first uh, slide. 
So what are some of the causes? Well, of course, there's the pandemic. You know, I'm not denying that that's not played a part in our restless uh, culture. Another daily death toll, pressures on the NHS leading to crisis, pressure to educate children at home, pressure to stay away from people, pressure to follow the rules, pressure, pressure, pressure. Squeeze a bottle of ketchup, put pressure on it, and you hope you'll get ketchup. You find out what's inside people when they're squeezed, when pressure is placed upon them. I wonder what happens when you squeeze a Christian. Is it Jesus that comes out of us? I think a lot of us as Christians are just as restless as those without faith. So, okay, so the pandemic is a kind of surface level. Thanks, Kirsty. The, the second lev- layer, I believe, under that is, is uh, distraction and the, the age of technology. Um, we're just barely over a decade into uh, this little thing called the smartphone. And uh, some of you are holding out. You've still got one of those old fashioned phones that all it does is send texts and phone calls. Uh, but many of us will have this thing called the smartphone and urbanization has taken place. People living in cities a lot more and there's so much more traffic, even in this lockdown. Have anyone noticed how much traffic there still is? People are still driving. I, I remember the first lockdown, it felt like a little breath of fresh air for the environment. And yet this lockdown feels quite different. We're still in we're only in, into a, a century uh, into the automobile, which is a blip in the human uh, history story. So there's this kind of surface level uh, of just noise and traffic and busyness and the phone and digital distraction, social media. That's underneath the pandemic. That was already there before COVID hit. But what's underneath technology? Well, we've got this thing called the human condition, the the thing that uh, goes biblically back to the Garden of Eden. Um, And this idea of overwhelm and restlessness and human transgressions and sin literally is on page three of the Bible. Uh, So. So I think there's there's different layers, there's different causes to our restlessness. And at the bottom, at the root of it is uh, this this kind of human condition the human problem of sin of uh, of am i enough am i good enough can i control my life what if everything spins out of control you know all of the kind of undercurrents of human nature of the soul that fuel the busyness it that fuels the busyness of our culture and the desire for distraction and and the attempt to escape in this book John Mark Comer uh, talks about an interview with Dallas Willard, who is a Christian writer. He's died now, but he uh, was uh, one of the the most prolific writers of the last century uh, about about discipleship. And he was asked, um, he was asked this question, uh, how can I uh, be the best person I can be? And he paused for a moment. And then he said, You've got to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And Dallas Willard would say that hurry is the biggest enemy of our spiritual life. And I don't know about you, when you're asked, how are you doing? How's your week been? Do you ever say, oh, busy? And it's almost like we celebrate busyness, don't we? We kind of, well, I do. I know that it's a temptation for me to say that I'm busy, almost to feel that that, that uh, I'm proving myself to you, especially if you're in St. Michael's and you ask me how I'm doing and how my week's been. I almost feel like I've got to say busy so that you feel like, oh, it's, he's, he's doing a good job. <laughs> you know, we, we almost glorify busyness in our culture. And yet, in the kingdom, the greatest value, the highest value uh, is love, not busyness. And love is time consuming. You can't hurry love. There's a song, I think, with that line. <laughs> you can't hurry love. You have, to be, you have to slow down to love. 
you have to slow down to love. The new speed of life isn't Christian. It's anti-Christian, John Mark Comer says. Think about it. What has the highest value in Christ's economy? It's love. Jesus made that crystal clear. He said the great, greatest commandment in all of the Bible uh, was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, followed by love your neighbor. But love is time consuming. Peace, love and joy are the products of slowing down enough to follow Jesus. I wonder how fast paced is your life, even in lockdown. The demands keep coming, don't they? The world says slow is bad, fast is good. You know, people with a lower IQ are often called slow. A boring movie, you might say, is slow. When service is bad in a restaurant, you say it's, the service was slow today. It's, it's painted uh, in a negative light. And yet Jesus uh, paints slow, slowing down in a positive light. Jesus was slow enough to love. And if we want to experience his love, uh, I believe we need to slow down to his pace for long enough to rest in his love. I'd like us to uh, look at a, a story in Luke's gospel. So Kirsty, if we can have the passage up on, on the screen. So this is Luke 10, verse 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. If we can go back to the previous slide, Kirsty. You see, I believe we need to be slowing down to be present to the giver of rest. If we want to be, move from restlessness to being restful, we need to be present to the giver of rest. That means we've got to slow down. We've got to cut some stuff out of our life. I love the fact that Jesus, when Martha complains, Jesus repeats her name. He says, Martha, Martha. I don't know if you can hear the love in the repetition of that. He says, you're worried and you're so upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Slow down, slow down and come and sit at my feet. That's where we're going to find rest, at the feet of Jesus. And of course, if you've been a Christian for any more than a year you'll know this like this is it's not that you don't know it I know that I'm preaching to the choir for many of you you know that sitting at God's feet that slowing down that being with him that's where we find our rest so what's wrong why is it that we're still so restless many of us or maybe it's just me <laughs> maybe I'm just preaching to myself this morning but Hopefully something of what I'm saying will resonate. I, I know that slow is boring, if I'm honest. I find, I find slowing down a bit dull. I find it hard to concentrate. I've got used to a fast-paced, dynamic, instant culture. Amazon Prime, deliver it to me tomorrow. I wonder how long it will be before we can expect a delivery today. Fast food, fast, fast entertainment. We demand it now and we want it instant. We don't want to wait. Slow is boring. Waiting is overrated. Uh, and yet there's something wrong. I know that <laughs> I know that my attention span has definitely not improving. Can anyone remember what the attention span of a goldfish is? 
Does anyone know the answer to that? What's the attention span of a goldfish that swims around its little bowl? And thinks every time it swims around, oh, that's interesting. I've not seen that before. Three seconds, isn't it? Is it three seconds? I think that might be memory. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I, 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 to be honest, I'm just reading what it says in the book. And it says uh, the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. That's pretty good, I think. Nine seconds. Do you want to hear something a bit shocking? That apparently the average attention span of a human living in 21st in the in 2021 in in western world is eight seconds we have a lower concentration span attention span than a goldfish and the scary thing is that back in 2000 they measured it and we had attention spans of 12 seconds so it's reduced it's reduced by four seconds something is wrong John Mark Comer in his book speaks about the danger of dis distract distractive technology. And he says this. Many of us, uh, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. technology uh, i mean it, some people love it some people hate it I, I know that some of you who uh are technology haters and you just you're you're cheering you go yes at last a sermon that is anti-technology and then some of you are like what no this is a gift from god come on we live in an age of technology and of course like you wouldn't be hearing me now like this wouldn't be possible if we didn't have this technology. It is a gift. It's wonderful. And yet it comes with inherent danger. I wonder how old were you when you first got a mobile phone? I remember back in my student days. So I'm not going to tell you how long ago that was, but I had a Nokia 3210. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's because you are too young. <laughs> Nokia 3210, it was amazing little phone uh, but it didn't do a lot but these were meant to be time-saving devices I, back then i remember standing in a queue and i had nothing to do i just had to stand and wait i had to slow down nowadays what do people do when they're in a queue they get out their smartphone and they start distracting themselves What's the first thing you do when you wake up? I wonder. I went through a season of uh, the first thing I do when I woke up, often because my alarm would go off on my phone, which was next to my bed. I'd open it up and I'd start looking at social media. That's the first thing that would start fueling my mind as I woke up. I'm sorry, Lucy, I'm not as holy as you that uh, I, I struggled to pray when I first got up. So I had to make a radical decision and I decided to charge my phone in a different place in the house. And you might think, well, what are you going to do about your alarm? Well, I made another radical decision. I bought an alarm clock. Didn't cost me much. It comes on with the radio and really annoys Catherine because it only comes on at full volume. I can't set the volume on this very cheap radio, radio alarm clock. I've got to find another alternative, but there are alternatives to having your phone by your bed. And it, I have to say it's helped me. Just that simple decision not to have my phone next to my bed uh, has helped me in the morning. Now, it, sometimes I, I get into the habit again of charging it next to my bed. I'm not going to pretend that I'm perfect and I've got it all sorted. This is a battle that is daily battle. And uh, the other thing I've, I've done, which has been quite helpful, has, has been to have a phone Sabbath. So on my day off, I've started trying not to carry my phone around with me. And uh, so if you try and contact me on my day off, don't be surprised if you get to voicemail because I'm not, not got my phone on me. I'm going to have a tech free uh, day. Well, mostly tech free. I'm trying not to have my phone starting with an easy step. But, you know, these prehistoric inventions, um, 
of alarm clocks have really, really been helpful. Uh, and I would encourage those of you who struggle with that. Um, but it's not just phone use, you see. The phones aren't the only baddie. Uh, checking your email, uh, social media, um, those, those, you know, those things are, are nothing when it compares to the fire breathing dragon of Netflix that can just suck up so much of our time. <laughs> uh, so much time is lost in the black hole of, uh, of our devices and, and streaming. And, and again, like, this is good stuff. I like, I rest quite well watching telly. I, I'm not saying it's of the devil. I'm, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that it has danger and it will affect your life. It will create a restless spirit in you if you give it too much time, if you allow it too much presence in your life. Interestingly, um, the original president of Facebook, Sean Parker, he said this in an interview uh, recently. He said, God only knows what, what uh, Facebook is doing to our, cult, to our children's brains. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post. And that's what's going, that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you more likes and comments. It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. So their aim was to distract you and to create restlessness. Now there's all sorts of symptoms. If you're wondering if this is you, there's all sorts of symptoms. Uh, and uh, over the coming weeks, we're going to look at how to combat this um, because there's some really practical uh, solutions. Uh, but these are some of the symptoms if, if you think that you might have a restless spirit. Your irri irritability, hypersensitivity, restlessness, workaholism, emotional numbness, out of order priorities, lack of care for your body, escapist behaviours, slippage of spiritual disciplines and isolation. And you know, this, this not only affects our relationship with God, but it affects our relationship with others. And if you just look before that story of Martha and Mary in ch chapter 10 of Luke, uh, Jesus has just finished telling the story of the Good Samaritan, of how people who were in a hurry just walked on by. They, were, they weren't interruptible except for this good Samaritan. And Jesus was the most interruptible person uh, that you could meet. He had the most important demanding job that anyone has ever had. His, his job was to bring salvation to the world. I mean, you can't beat that. And yet he was the most interruptible person. How interruptible are you? Now, I realize I've kind of, probably uh, spoken a lot of negative things this morning. I've hopefully helped us see that there is probably some restlessness going on in amongst us. And yet, I wanna just draw attention back to, to Jesus's response to Martha. Jesus's response to Martha. He says, Martha, Martha. He speaks her name. I believe he probably said it slowly. And I think God says your name slowly and repeats it this morning. Just, just hear him saying your name slowly. He's saying it more than once because he wants to get your attention. He says, Kirsty, Kirsty. He says, Liz. Liz, Chris, Chris, like he says your name with so much love and desire for you. He wants your attention and he wants to remind you that the best decision you can make in every day is to come and slow down and sit with him. Uh, 
I'm going to put some uh, links to some songs in the chat because um, I think this is this needs a bit of extended time and I, I realize that we could have a very very long service if we have a long time of worship now uh, but but I'm going to put some links and I'd, I'd love it if uh, uh, if you could just take those into your day um, at some point today just carve out a bit of time just for you to sit with God like Mary the sit at his feet without rushing without having anything to do now I know this is hard because we can't just make all of the demands go away like I can't just stop working I can't stop being a parent I can't stop having to pay bills like the of course one day we'll be able to just experience the the wonderful uh non non demands of heaven on earth um but I still think God will have work for us to do. And so somehow we've got to work out how do we continue working and holding the responsibilities that we have whilst, bring, whilst crafting rhythms in our day that allow us to rest. And so, uh, Kirsty, if we just have the last slide. The, the last slide. So I think it's the next one. Thank you. Um, so. These are some of the things that we're going to be looking at over the coming term. These are some of the spiritual practices that are going to help us to build in rhythms into our life that will help us to rest, to be a restful people. We'll look at silence and solitude. We'll look at Sabbath. We'll look at slowing down and we'll look at simplicity. And if you want to uh, just get there quicker, <laughs> uh, then I'm sorry, we're not hurrying through this. Uh, but there are there are talks you can listen to online if you want to or you can buy the book and start to read that alongside listening to these talks so god bless you as you uh, navigate rest in a crazy covid lifestyle <laughs> and uh, I, I, we're going to just have a, a song now just to help us just to reflect on maybe the the thing that God's saying to you, what's the one thing he's wanting to say to you today?